Yeah, it should be a recording that as well. Um, it might even have a little video of me in it. So I want to introduce you to the BSc Information Technology and also, it, for the, we haven't got any today, but also for the Analytics Joint Honours pro Programme where students will do three modules, uh, four mod uh, three modules a, ter a year from the BSc IT and three modules a year from some other programme, could be maths or finance or uh, accounting or business, and we get one or two of those each year. So it covers both sides. Now, one of the things that Chris mentioned a little bit is we're thinking more and more about employability. So um, what I've been doing, and we're now beginning to roll out across the computing department, is not just assessing the academic ability of students. Because all that does is show, are you very clever? And if you're very clever, then you can probably go and do be a, uh, a PhD eventually and then become an academic and so on and do research. But the problem has been that businesses for the last gee, 20, 30 years have been saying, yeah, all you graduates coming out of university, yeah, they're clever, but they're actually unemployable. It takes Rolls-Royce something like £65,000 to turn a graduate into a Rolls-Royce employee. And we've seen it get worse in some respects over the last 10, 15 years with the um, generations X, Y and Z because they tend to be a little bit less interested in following the rules and the requirements and so on. And so the, they keep saying they're functionally unemployable and they, all sorts of things. They're not interested in spelling and grammar and syntax and so on. They can't talk properly. They can't sell themselves. They can't sell their ideas. So what we're looking at now is moving from just academic assessment to assessment for employability. Thinking particularly about things like transferable skills or soft skills um, and compliance with all the standards. In actual fact, even with those are PhD students, if an academic, if we don't follow the, the, the requirements, our papers don't get published. And you know, if our, Bo or I are submitting a paper for a conference, it will say six or eight pages, including everything. And so we try and slip one with that three lines extra, and back comes a nice little email that says, oh, it's a brilliant paper, but would you like to pay $100 per page over the six-page limit? And our bosses here are not going to fund that extra uh, $100 a page. Fix it. So even they actually, the academic side, have to follow the rules. So what we're doing, and as, as Chris was saying, you know, we're looking at solving problems. So what we're actually going to be, or have been doing now more and more, is we're not going down the classic route, here's a textbook, go learn all the answers. Because if I teach you an answer, you stop thinking. Because you know the answer for the rest of the time. The trouble is, the answer is only there at a very particular point in time, in a particular context. And in our field of computing, there have been no, essentially no new questions in the last 50 years. Questions have stayed the same. The answers vary everywhere over time and between different companies. So we're teaching people to actually learn the questions and how to find the questions. And then, yeah, how to solve them, but in the context. You see, so what we're then thinking about is going back to that employability of technology and so on. And this came out of a, a piece of work by a company called SAS uh, five, six years ago. Universities typically are quite good at the technical skills. But typically, they have in the past been awfully bad at these transferable skills or soft skills. So things like curiosity. I mean, it's fascinating. We get the students walking back and forth between this building and a quarter of a mile up the road to the other place, uh, um, just along the road, along the, this lovely little stream. And a number of students who don't even notice that there's a stream there which changes from week to week, month to month, and so on, they have no curiosity. Those little two-year-olds who keep asking why, the school system across most of the world is very good at getting rid of that curiosity. And then we have to put it back into them. So curiosity is incredibly important. 
problem identification and solving. We've added the problem identification because you guys are going to go out there and you're going to be solving problems. You aren't going to be always given a problem to solve. You may have to go look for it. Um, creativity. If we go down the lines of here's a textbook, you stay locked in that little tiny closed world of the topic. But what we're trying to do is to get them to think outside the box, sadly, is a horrible phrase, but we're trying to get them to think outside their own area and pick up stuff from over there or over there, bring it together and come up with something new. And we're beginning to see quite a lot of this beginning to develop. So by the time the students who go through the BSCIT, they're getting really quite good at that, or many of them get very good at that. <coughs> yeah, we need to work together. We don't necessarily assess the working together we do team projects, but most of that assessment is, again, on their own individual uh, uh, capability. Because, let's face it, when you're at Rolls-Royce, your annual review, it's about you. Mm. It's not about the team's achievements. That is part of the team leader's assessment. <coughs> and so we're trying to keep away as much as possible from um, joint team assessments. But you, we get you to work together, and you'll be doing that in your second semester. Got to communicate. It's really important to communicate effectively and persuasively. And this is an interesting phrase, that storytelling phrase. Almost immediately after this little report came out in October 2014, I began to notice that the phrase storytelling cropped up everywhere. And so we're trying to get students to actually be able to tell a story effectively. Because humans like stories. That's what connects. Not the facts and the facts and the facts necessarily, but create, putting it all together. And I think that's why there's that fantastic difference in Britain between, say, Michael Gove, who is incredibly logical, and Boris Johnson, who is completely illogical, but he tells a story very, very persuasively. And we're trying to get a mix of that, have the logic, but also that storytelling capability. And I love that statement by Albert Einstein. I'm intensely curious, passionately curious. That's what we're trying to develop. Because education isn't about filling buckets, but it's about lighting those fires, getting that curiosity to find out how the world works, what's really going on. And so, like Philip Pullman said long ago, I want you to research and read like a butterfly, dotting around, but write like a bee. Now, we can do all that, doesn't matter how you do the researching, but we need you to end up with a nice, linear, compelling narrative. And so, if you do a bit of um, read a bit, write a bit, it's a shambles. You don't even know where you're getting to until you happen to get somewhere. But you need to be finding the information and then planning it down, that golden arrow, because you already know the conclusion before you start writing. And that's one of the things we're doing in the very first semester, that I teach the introduction to computer science across the whole of the program, uh, the computing program, um, and get them to write a really interesting three-page article by week six. And most of, them are surprised, most of the students are completely surprised by what they achieve because they suddenly then had to. Now, thinking about that compliance and assessment for employability, what I've been doing, and we're now beginning to roll out across the rest of the computing department, is that in the past, you have the blue line of, here is just your academic score. What we're now doing, and I've been doing this now for five years, roughly, is saying 20% of the grade actually is reserved for perfect compliance with all the presentation, you know, syntax, grammar, spelling, citing and referencing, <coughs> sorting your bibliography, and so on and so forth. Because what it does, it actually achieves what businesses are telling us. Because here is the borderline first class on us on 70%, so you've got a first. But I can't be bothered to follow and comply. Suddenly, you're a 2-2. And that's putting you outside the sort of interest level area for recruitment, typically. Yeah, at that level, it doesn't add a huge amount. It adds about 5%. 
to the 70 percent. At 80, it, uh, sorry, 85, it gets you to 80, 88 percent. So that's a, it's a very small increment there. But at the bottom end, if we take, say, the borderline pass, 40 percent, basic third, that 20 percent for compliance takes you into the 2-2. Two -two. Which make, because, and I had this confirmed la, uh, back in October, I think it was, when we had a chief engineer from ITP Aero in, in uh, Whetstone in Leicester. And he was saying that for the last five years, they've only recruited their placement students from Derby. Don't look anywhere else, because our students do the things they want in terms of those soft skills. And he was saying he would much prefer to have someone sort of, where's that, oh, 60, borderline 2-1, two, 2-2, two, two, one, two, two, and with a really good compliance. It bumps them up, because we know they're more employable, they're more useful. And so we begin to apply this now to um, the, fight, the dissertation this year, the lit review, we're building this into the assessment process. So we get that uplift because they're employable. So what's it look like? <clears throat> Don't worry about the color coding because this is BSCIT. We haven't got any analytics, but it'll show in red the modules which the analytics students will be doing. But these are the ones that you will be doing in the first year. So first year, you do programming one because everybody needs to understand how to actually use co uh, coding systems, programming languages. The target of programming one is not really for you to learn a language, a specific language for using in the future, but it's to learn how a programming language works. What are the things that make it happen? Because by understanding that, then you begin to understand why some computer systems aren't worth having, or it won't work. You can't solve that problem with that type of computer system. We have this introduction to computer science, which is Half it's taught by a colleague of mine about bits and bytes and how the things work, logic and all sorts of things. I do the other half, which is studying skills and employability skills. And that's where we're beginning to introduce this idea of, now you're not here just to, get, to show that you're clever, but that you're actually going to be useful to somebody as an employee. And you start off a, a, a module that runs all the way through the two semesters because it's, if we try to do it as a single module in one, sorry, a module in one semester, it's a bit heavy going. So we make it a bit gentler. But it gets you, to, um, to, brings everybody up to the same level of maths that they need to be able to do um, computer programming. Then the second semester, Introduction Data Analysis, this is all about using a language called SAS which is one of the best languages for data analysis that is used by Big Pharma, by aerospace like Rolls-Royce, um, the, the world of finance, because it's an incredibly well-proven environment. Then we've got IT Design Studio and client-side web development, which did get between the two of them help you to understand how to design layouts on screens and how to create that interface between the human and the uh, computers. And f so that's that part, and that part is how you actually get the, to create the data and store the data and so on. In the second year, the first semester, the one we've just finished, is a really rather magical environment. IT services management, IT product design, and databases. Because these three show how that, although the titles appear to be standalone individual modules, they actually cover the entire task from the beginning of I need to have a new something uh, through. So that's a very top level. So senior management will be typically looking at that sort of thing. Then this goes down to the designers, the systems analysts, and the art systems architects. And this bit then is the kind of bit right at the bottom where the data lives. And so it's the complete, essentially the complete cycle on, of how the whole of computing or IT actually works. And then we do, in the second semester, a team project. 
which is a, again is a, a module which runs across the entire uh, um, scheme of computer science and computing. And we build teams or get teams of three, four, five to form themselves and they choose a real world problem. And at the end of it, they have a five day period when they have to actually deliver on it. And they will have daily supervisions to replicate the nine to five job that they would otherwise have if they're outside. And that goes quite well. We also do data management business intelligence, which is a sort of thing that Chris was mentioning earlier on. And that again takes your SAS and analytics skills to the next level and could include also uh, other languages like R or Watson Analytics. And then at the moment we have this one a business option, so you'll ch ch have a, a choice between these three modules run by the business school. Uh, we don't always run all three, so your choices may be slightly constrained. But this gives you some connection to business to give you some insights as to what they might be wanting to have solved in there. Because marketing uh, has been one of the great greatest users of business analytics. Then, placement year. It's technically optional, and yes, you get a, a diploma in professional practice, but we really, really want you to start thinking our students think much more about actually going on that placement year. It's really, really important. And because it almost always leads to job offers. If I think about the, our past BSC IT students who've gone on their placement year, almost every one of them has gone back to that company a year later. So it's, it solves that problem, that chicken egg problem. I want a job, but I haven't got experience. I've got the experience now, so I can get a job. And then the final year, this is when it gets real fun for you. you do, there's an independent studies pro project that you have to choose. You then find a supervisor from your academics who've been teaching you that you like their project or, and or you like them. And you'll get a series of supervisions, half hour supervisions, during the first semester, and then you get some more supervisions during the second semester as well. In total, you get about six hours of concentrated time on each of you. And you can choose a project that you, that's your own, or you can choose from a list that we provide of the things which are interesting and are part of our research program. And then in the first semester, you do two modules, Sustainable Information and Corporate Governance, which is all about how, what should we be doing within business, within industry, within organizations to make sure that we're actually running our business legally, ethically, morally, and also thinking about the long-term viability of our organization. And then we take from the corporate position through to the information governance side where we're beginning to look at what should we be doing with our data, how should we be protecting it, what are the consequences of things like the European General Data Protection Regulations, at, which we've all heard about by now, or the Data Protection Act 2018. And so we're, build, we're looking at all of those sort of things. <coughs> and in there, as one of this module I teach, the assignment will be related to a leading edge problem, a big problem, and all the students have to choose through research a little area that's of interest to them. And in fact, we started that back in ITSM, in IT Services Management, and in Intro to Computer Science, where again, each of those assignments are set as huge areas that they must find an interesting thing that really associates with them, that they are connected to. Because if they have chosen that problem, they will solve that problem. If it's my problem, they won't to the same extent. I had one yesterday, I was looking at a second year student, who <coughs> was very, very interesting, came in and said, oh Richard, I'm terribly worried, I really got very confused and very lost and I don't think it's very good. So I read it through and it was magical. It's the best second year assignment I've read in, in that, from that module for, I don't know, five years. 
She had chosen to look at the, uh, the problem, is it to cre create or introduce a new service that's a benefit to somebody, and it's posed to that. And she had looked at a book that came out in February last year called The Invisible Women. Uh, data, it's to do with data being collected for the average male, 80 kilo male, which doesn't work for most people. And in there, there's a little story about how a city in Sweden were looking at their city council portfolio of things, and someone jokingly, uh, and for gender bias, and someone jokingly, well, at least with snow clearance, we haven't got a problem, have we? And they thought, oh, maybe, maybe not. So they had a look at it and discovered that the way that they, everybody does snow clearing, it's the main roads, because it helps get people into work and back again, which is great for the average male, because the average male goes straight to work and comes straight home. But even the women with full-time jobs don't go straight to work. They go via school, a bit of shopping or something. <coughs> and they thought, okay, right, let's swap. So we'll do it differently. We will do the snow clearing for the, you know, the, the, the um, sort of urban stuff rather than the main roads and, and the pavements. And they discovered that it didn't cost any more to do it that way around. The lorries, the buses, the cars could get through three, four inches of snow perfectly happily on these main roads. But people with pushchairs, buggies, wheelchairs, bikes have problems on half an inch of snow. And they discovered that it would, they actually saved two, three, four times the snow clearing budget in the health bills, broken ankles, hip bones, and so on. And so this last was reading that and thought, hey, this is something really great. What I can do, I can build a little app, or I can specify a service relating to that little app, some snow depth sensors, readings onto a map, the city uh, clearance, snow clearance people can see that, and the users, the people, the citizens can see where it's safe for them to go and walk and so on. Solving a real problem. And we're doing this through there, there, and there, and here. All of those. And I teach that and that and that module, and a colleague teaches that at the moment. And so that's corporate governance. Advanced analytics is taking your analysis of data skills further with new languages like R and Python. A lot of students are now take, picking up Python, which is the most um, demanded analytics language for AI and analytics there is across the world. It's a very, very clever language, very good one. Two module, modules here which are taught together, but the assessment is a slightly different twist on the question. The basic question is the same, but they're answering different aspects of the problem in those two assignments. So we're going looking at different aspects of, again, what is it that organizations should be thinking about as they try and solve problems or with big data, typically I keep it as or in the big data, the analytics, the AI side. Um, <coughs> and then emerging IT product development is looking at the types of technologies that are coming at us, um, whether it's ele electric vehicles or uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, it could be um, various sorts of AI, machine learning. There's a, a, a curve called the Gartner Hype Curve which shows technologies which are just starting up, that everybody's saying are becoming fantastic, and then there's the other side of the curve is that it goes down, most of these technologies sort of drop off because it actually doesn't meet its uh, objectives, it's uh, the dreams that were had. And so this one is to teach them, or for the students to learn how to evaluate technologies that might or might not be valuable. To f understand the core, at the center of each of these technologies, what is it that drives them? So that they can then build a model of some sort, it could be a theoretical model, it could be a numerical model, it could even be built a lap of it, and then critically evaluate, does it, is it going to achieve its objectives? So last year we were actually looking at blockchain, which is now beginning to be shown not to be as anything like as useful as many of the proponents of it were saying, <coughs> because people don't sit down and critically evaluate the things in the way that 
the students learn here. So our students coming out with that are going to be much more useful when they get into employment because they know how to ask the right questions. And having f identified the right question, then working out how to find all the information that allows you to do that critical analysis and come up with a solid research and analysis-based um, answer to, is it going to be worthwhile investing in? You know, we see so much about electric vehicles at the moment, but there's so many questions about the infrastructure, where we get the electricity from, where we get the, the cobalt from, where we get the lithium from, and <laughs> it's going to be interesting. And so some of the students have found that, or they've looked at um, modelling the use of drones for security to replace fixed CCTV cameras, which is another area that everybody is jumping on and saying, oh, drones are going to be fantastic. But when you actually start modelling it, it becomes, well, you've got lots of interesting questions, and it might actually be cheaper just to put lots more cameras around like we've got here than trying to fly drones around and change their batteries and whatever else. And so we get them to look at all sorts of interesting things which are interesting to them. Every one of you, and you will find, if you come here, all the way through, lots of interesting things that you're interested in, not me per se, you will probably find something that I didn't know about. And I will learn from you. And because I go to these, uh, these conferences and talk about these governance issues, questions for getting your technology right, often I'm using ideas that come from people like you. And your names are up there as the contributors. Part of using your research to feed my research, to my output, which tends not to be technical publications, but much more conference stuff. So that's how we're really going about it. So what our focus is really on is you ultimately as an excellent future employee. Yeah, we we'll expect you to learn those technical skills. We don't teach them on this program. We expect you to go learn them because that's what happens when you go on your placement year. They don't have, most of the companies you go to don't have the 1,500 quid for, to put you on a course. They'll say, go find. YouTube's out there. The manuals are out there. Go find and learn. And so you're learning how to learn as well. Brilliant transferable skills, these soft skills that make you employable. <clears throat> and we help you to learn how to fit into the team. So that's our real focus. I think that is the last one. Yeah.